going to be let in on something that is classified top secret. I don't know what it is about our sense of curiosity, but if you tell me there's a secret, I all of a sudden want to know it. It doesn't matter if it's my business or your business or their business. If it's a secret, man, I want to know it. In the military, I, I had the opportunity to uh, get a top secret clearance. You know, there's three levels of classification. The first is confidential. The next is secret. And the top is top secret. And so if you're dealing with top secret information, you know it's very special. It is to be protected. It is to be guarded. It is of utmost importance to our national defense. And then within those uh, top two tiers of classification, there are even programs that are what they call SAR. Everything has an acronym, but SAR stands for Special Access Requirements. And so there are even compartments of, of information that even though you had a top secret clearance, you had to get another approval level to have special access to get to see this information. One of those programs I was involved in was the B-2 In the mid-1970s, the United States government began to study the science of stealth technology trying to come up with a weapons platform, and in this case, a long-range strike bomber that could against the then nemesis, the Soviet Union. Remember, we were locked in an arms race, a nuclear struggle, whereby we were threatening each other with total annihilation through the use of these nuclear weapons. And the Air Force in particular was charged with developing system that could secretly leave the United States, go all the way over to the heart of Russia in Moscow and deliver a lethal blow on our behalf and guarantee our victory against our arch rival. Well, the scientists studied the concepts associated with stealth technology to try to make a large airplane in appear nearly invisible to radar so that it can make that long trek across the ocean and into Siberia uh, without being picked up by our enemy and thus have a successful mission. By the mid-80s, it was in production, but the first photo never emerged until November of 1988, my first year at the Air Force Academy. And even so, they, they let this picture out to show what they had done in, in total secrecy over 15 some years, because it was important not to let the enemy know what we were up to so that we would maintain that advantage. When they let that picture go, it was just a picture of the front. They wouldn't allow you to see the picture of the back because of the shape uh, was still thought to be very much important, and they didn't want that information out. So they said, hey, here's proof that we're doing something, uh, but you don't get to see the whole thing. And so it was piecemeal. And then finally in 1997, it became fully operational. Uh, you saw pictures. You saw it flying for the first time. A lot more information out there. But even still to this day, there is top secret information about that weapon system platform that I had to sign on the dotted line that, okay, I, I forgot everything you told me about this. So if somebody ever asks me, I, I don't know the answer. And of course, that famous line, well, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. And uh, we don't want to do that. And I don't plan on killing anybody this morning or getting you in trouble with this top secret information that we're going to talk about in First Peter chapter 1. So if you're there, I'm excited to review what the Apostle Peter has for us this morning, starting in verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Father, I am completely morning, uh, your spirit this morning to accurately handle the word of truth. We pray that you would join us, that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear 
may my words be your words this morning. May they be faithful and true to the scripture. May you encourage us in the most holy faith and be glorified as we proclaim your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. By way of review, verse 9. We see that though you, verse 8, though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Who is the you? Remember in our introduction to the first uh, epistle of Peter, that it's to the elect. That is, that is those who are saved, redeemed by the Spirit of God through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The object of our faith, we have this joy. It is a, an emotion, an expression of happiness and success in anticipation of something that has been obtained or will be obtained in the future. And that word that, ex, that, that says obtaining in verse 9, in the Greek it means presently receiving. So you, if you're a Christian are the audience, and you are obtaining or presently receiving the outcome of your faith, which is salvation. Salvation is a rescuing, it is a redeeming, and by salvation it requires a problem set prior to. Something that you need saving from, something that you need rescuing from, which is our sin, our rebellion against our God and maker. And remember our father Adam in the Garden of Eden. He and his wife Eve rebelled against God. They disobeyed. That is sin. They missed the mark of perfection. And they brought upon us, the entire human race, the consequences of sin, which is namely the wrath of God. And so when we... Born into this world, sinners manifest by the fact that from the moment we come out, we're crying and screaming about how things are not going our way. We need this, we need that, and we need it right away. But God says it's actually all about Him and His glory, and so we are at odds with Him and are the objects of His wrath. As cute and cuddly as we are when we're purified and we have milk and our diapers been changed, we are still objects of his wrath. And then of course as we get older and especially as we enter the teenage years, it becomes obvious why we're objects of his wrath with some of our actions. As we get older we, we hide them a little better, but trust me, I am still worthy of the wrath of God outside of the protecting grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have this salvation through him. We have been rescued from the penalty of sin, which was that condemnation, that eternal separation from God that all of us were under in our rebellion against him. He said, you will be penalized. You will be punished for that. You will suffer my wrath. So we've been delivered. We've been saved from the penalty. But we've also been delivered and saved from the power of sin. Remember, outside of Christ, you are a slave to sin. You're shackled. You go where sin takes you. You can make choices as long as they're in line with sin. But you can't choose righteousness. You can't please God. You can't obey God. You can't earn any favor in his sight because you are a slave to sin. It has power over you. You must obey your master. But now, elect, chosen in Christ... Christian, believer, you have been set free from that power. And now you can do the right thing for the right reason at the right time because God has set you free from that enslaving power of sin. And now you have been given the power of the Spirit. That is a big deal. That's why in verse 6 of this chapter, he says, in this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Are any of you grieved today by some various trial? 
I know you are because you're human this side of heaven living on this earth. So I know your life's not perfect. And Peter tells us, but that's okay. You still, in the reality of life, you are still able to rejoice. Why? Because this salvation that you have obtained is so great. Like what is a cold? What is a flat tire? What is a lost job? What is a lost house? What even is a lost loved one in light of the God who made you, has loved you, and saved you? And he's preparing a place for you and your salvation is ready to be revealed in the last day. And he is leading, guiding, directing you every facet, every aspect of your life, every circumstance. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 28, that he's working together for your good. It's a good thing. You have been saved. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm not excited about the flat tire, but I know the facts of the word of God inform my mind, they transform my thinking so that I see the flat tire as part of God's perfect will for my life that he's using for good. It's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of sweat. It's not a waste of energy. It's something that he has ordained for his glory and my good. And so I'm okay with that. This, when he was talking to his disciples in John chapter 15, verse 11, he said, these things to you so that my joy may be in you. And that your joy may be full. So despite the fact that you and I live on this imperfect earth outside of the Garden of Eden. The scriptures teach us that our joy may be full. And our joy is full when we are concentrating on this salvation that we are obtaining, that we are presently receiving, verse 9, the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls, our very inmost being. That's a review. Verse 10. Concerning this salvation, okay, that's the first S. For the title is secrets. The first S is salvation in verse 10. Remember, the realm of salvation, the psalmist said in chapter 3, verse 8, that salvation belongs to the Lord. He is the one who is mighty to save. I'm not able to save. You're not able to save. Only the Lord is able to save. Second Timothy, chapter 1, says, God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works... Good thing, huh? Good thing that we're not getting judged on, on my works. Good things for me, I know that. You answer your own question. Time in. But because of his own purpose, what a truth for us to always be reminded about. Ultimately, things are happen, happening for your agenda, for my agenda, for my purposes, your purposes. No, for his purposes... And grace, which he, God the Father, gave us, believers, in Christ Jesus, when? Before the ages began. God gave you your salvation before the ages began. Before you were even born. Before the foundation of the world. What? How could he do that? He's God. He's able. That's what the scriptures say. I'm just reading him. Your salvation was obtained before, and it was decreed before ages even began. You mean he wasn't waiting on me to see how I might respond to a, a gospel presentation? No, he wasn't waiting on that. You mean he wasn't uh, waiting to see if, if I as a Christian could carefully enough articulate with my neighbor the truth of the scriptures to see if this neighbor would be saved? No. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says before the ages began, because of his grace, he gave salvation to the elect, to his children, to the church, to the bride of Christ. Remind me how this salvation occurs. You probably got Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 memorized. Probably. For by grace. What does that word grace mean? Unmerited favor. What a beautiful word. It's going to come up today time and time again. Grace. 
unmerited favor. When you merit something, you earn it. When you go to work, you do your job, you earn your pay, you receive your salary. Salvation, acceptance by God, is not earned. It's not merited. It is given by grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace, you, Christian, have been saved through faith. Faith is the instrument. Faith is the means that God uses to bring about this transition, this rebirth, this salvation, this right standing with God himself. And this, what is this referring to? Faith. And this faith is not your own doing. The faith that you have, Christian... You can't be proud and puffed up about it. Yep, I generated me some saving faith. Look at me. Doing good, huh? Yeah, I stand out in the neighborhood. I'm a guy with this beautiful faith. No, it says, and this is not your own doing. It is what? The gift of God. We're excited about Christmas. We talk about the ultimate Christmas present, the gift God giving his only begotten son for you, for your neighbor. This gift of salvation, this gift of faith comes from God. He generates it, he makes it, and he plants it in you. He gives it to you. And why does he do it like that? It says because not a, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Mm, I sure would boast. If I could come up with some saving faith, I would say, oh, I'd boast about it. I'd tell you how great I am. I probably wouldn't give you the secret of how I did it, but I'd probably try to sell you some. And I'd convince you how wonderful it is and how wonderful I am and my company of, of faith. And you should just buy you a bottle of faith and I'll see you in heaven. Oh, boy, I'd be, I'd be rock star status if I could do that. And I would, trust me, if I, could, if I could get all that credit and get people to like me and write me nice letters and give me all their money, you better believe I'd do it. God knew that. When I said, have that, we can't have just a, just a old created person getting all the credit and all the glory and all the praise and adoration. No, he is the only one that gets those things. He is the only one that gets the credit. So if you wake up, one day, like the Apostle Paul, and the scales fall off your eyes, and all of a sudden you see spiritual truth, you understand the gospel, know that you didn't just wake up super smart one day. God has graced you with the gift of faith that's resulting in your salvation, your rescue. So apply that first phrase in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, and ask yourself, Am I Christian? Am I a follower of Christ? Am I a believer? Do I have faith in God and His only Son, Jesus Christ? Do you have the grace of Christmas? Do you have the Christ child, the Savior of the world, alive in your life? That's the most important question you can ask yourself. That's the most important truth that you can search out in the Scriptures. And that's the most important gift you can share with your neighbor this Christmas time of year and every time of year because it's always applicable, it's always apropos, it's always appropriate, it's always the right question to ask. Are you saved? Do you know Jesus? Are you being rescued from the wrath of God? If not, please consider the truth of the gospel. Well, next we see searching still in verse 10. The prophets who prophesied about the grace, unmerited favor, that was to be yours, Christian. They, the prophets, searched and inquired carefully. What a fascinating plan we see rolled out. I talked about how it took over 15 years for the plan to get stealth technology incorporated into an airplane such that we came up with the B-2 Spirit, the stealth bomber. Many more years than that, we see the plan of God's salvation rolling out through the Old Testament, beginning with those prophets from Moses to Malachi. Although, who was the last Old Testament prophet? John the Baptist. Yeah, he was. So all of those prophets 
what does the scripture say? They were prophesying. They were predicting the future. They were telling what was to come. What was to come? The grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. What do we know the grace of God to be? We're putting all these other scriptures together to see salvation, faith in Christ Jesus. They're writing about these things, but they don't, they don't have the whole picture. They, they have a piece of the puzzle, but they don't have access to this information over here to complete it. So they have an idea, and they're certainly curious. What, what is this mystery? What is this secret? What is this hidden truth that is coming to fruition slowly but surely over time? They are interested in seeing what God is unveiling. And why, why was it not revealed completely to them? I don't know. <laughs> Secret things belong to the Lord. It's his process of declassifying information at different times through different people, through different means. And finally one day he's going to reveal the full picture of what it all looks like in his perfect timing for his purposes. But they, they, the prophets, they were searching and inquiring carefully. So the application for you and I are, is, are we? Are we searching and inquiring to learn about this grace? This greatest of all gifts, this good news of the gospel, this reason for the season of Christmas? After all, we have the word of God before us. Apps in written form on our phones electronically. So many resources, so many assets for us to dive into, to research, to learn, to understand, to comprehend by the Spirit of God. A good example in Acts chapter 17 verse 11 of a group they called the Bereans. Why? Because the apostles were preaching to them and sharing them. And what did they do? They went back to the house and they searched the scriptures to see if these things were so. So that's a good practice for you. You don't just listen to what I say or what Pastor Craig says up here and then take it as a truth. You go back, you read the scriptures. When I give you the reference, you go back, you look to see if I'm, I'm quoting the right thing. Make sure I'm not quoting from the book of Nehemiah. My last name is Neil. Nehemiah chapter 1. Verse 1, you don't want those verses. They may be funny, but they're not going to last for eternity. You make sure truth is coming from the scriptures. You and I search daily this great treasure chest we have called the Word of God. Thirdly, we see suffering. In verse 11, these prophets, they were inquiring what person or what time, who and when, the Spirit of Christ in them was indicated when he predicted, that is the Spirit of Christ, predicted to the prophets the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. <coughs> the sufferings of Christ. You know, this was a difficult thing for the Jewish people. Remember, they were always inclined to want the Messiah to come and establish his kingdom, to overthrow those oppressive Romans, the people who were putting them down. They wanted their king to come in and, and set up the kingdom and get them on the A-team and eliminate all their suffering. But the scriptures are replete with the prophecies saying that the Messiah must suffer. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 24, through 26. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him, that's Jesus, they did not see. Verse 25. And he said to them, the angel, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You've got it written down. All you got to do is read it. It's right there for you. What's your excuse? Verse 26. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? The scriptures teach us. They are right there. Take them, open them, study them, see that yes, the prophets prophesied how the Messiah must definitely suffer. Acts chapter 3 verse 18 
but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. God's word is true. It'll strengthen your faith if you go back and read how those prophets hundreds of years prior to the Messiah showing up told exactly what the Christ would do and how he would suffer. Psalm 22, Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53. Go back, read those, and then see what happened to Jesus and see how it was there hundreds of years prior. That'll build your faith that this word is not just a relic, but it is in fact coming from God. It is in fact without error. It is true. It's profitable for you to study, to carefully search and inquire. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But we see him, that is Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. So that by the grace of God, there's that word grace again, he, Jesus, might taste death for everyone. Why is that a grace of God that Jesus tasted death for everyone? (coughs) So that you and I don't have to, right? What a gift. We were in line to suffer death and the consequences of spiritual death, separation from God, the wrath of God, but the grace of God in Jesus. He has made way for us to skip that line, to skip that wrath. Verse 10, Hebrews 2. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, there you go again. Who's this life about? It's about Jesus. It says, all things exist for him. For me, not for you, for him. And by him all things exist. In bringing many sons to glory, that is salvation, and that includes daughters as well. In bringing you to salvation, Jesus, God should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Did the Messiah suffer? Yes, he did. Who was the author of that suffering? God Who is your Lord and Savior? Who are you following? Jesus Christ? Is he your master? What did Jesus the master say? The servant's not greater than the master. If if I had to endure this, don't you think you're going to endure it also? That's what you call expectation management. Okay, you read the scriptures, you learn about what life's going to be like. And... Peter already told us in our, in our earlier verse 6, chapter 1, that yeah, there's, there's going to be trials, of course. That's, that's normal, but don't let that get you down. Why? Because of the grace of God you've been given in the Christ child, the Savior of the world. You've been reconciled. You've been rescued. These little things, you are also being made perfect as his child through suffering. Suffering is to the Christian life, to the human experience outside of the garden. Don't be surprised by it, but saturate your mind with the truth of the scriptures and the gospel so that you can be like Paul. Paul, the greatest apostle, he suffered all kinds of ways, right? All kinds of ways, shipwrecked, beaten, snake bit, harassed, stoned, left for dead. And yet he's the guy in Romans chapter 8 who had his thinking so transformed by the word of God. This is what he said, and this is what you and I can say by way of application when we walk out of here and experience normal life. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. You have access to this top secret information about this eternal salvation that has been accomplished for you personally. You've been chosen by God. How special is that? Not because you are special or you did some special work, but just to the praise of his glorious grace, Ephesians chapter 1, three times. He chose you. To be the object of his affection. To receive that Christmas gift. To be loved 
by the God who made you, you're set. You have peace with God. Not the wrath of God to look forward to, but eternity with the one who made you and knows you. You have this to look forward to. So flat tire, cold, flu, surgery, whatever. That is so worth it. Do not take my eternal salvation, my peace with God away. Give me a flat tire every time I get on you at one if you have to. But please, don't take the peace of God away. Eternal salvation in heaven. Oh, what good news. Yes, there's suffering. And yes, Christ led the way. And the prophets, they taught about that. Showing that the Christ would suffer, the Messiah would suffer, but there would be subsequent glories at the end of verse 11. And that is what Paul alludes to in Romans chapter 8. And that is what we must keep in the forefront of our minds so that we don't lose heart and lose hope. That this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. It's not my house forever. The one that creaks and leaks and all those things. No, my home is in heaven. So I'm investing in heavenly things. I'm focused on eternal things that last forever. Of course, I'm going to go do my job. Of course, I'm going to pay my bills. Of course, I'm going to cut my grass. Yeah, I'm going to do all those things, but my focus is long-term towards eternity and heaven. So this is going to allow me, fourthly, to serve We see serving in verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving, not themselves, but you, Christian. Those prophets were serving you and me. Who else was the great servant? Matthew chapter 20. And uh, verse starting with... 26. Jesus' words here. It shall not be so among you, Christians, but whoever would be great among you, First Baptist Isla Morada, must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as man, that is Jesus Christ, came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Are you following his example? The prophets served. The Christ served. And so the saints are to serve. That is our occupation. That is our calling. Are you serving the Son of Man? As he set an example for you to follow. This afternoon, are you serving your neighbor? Tomorrow, you want to come down and and serve at the church? We'll give you some Publix to unload and put in the pantry. Come down Tuesday, we'll give you an opportunity to serve some of those in our community who uh, need a little help, a little helping hand with some food or some clothing. Uh, Need a little encouragement. Fellowship with them. Tell them about this Christmas present that you know so well from the Word of God, the eternal truth that will meet their greatest need, come down on Tuesday, sit with Steve and Nancy and and serve your community and love on these people. You want to come on Wednesday night and serve in the ladies' ministry? You can do that. You want to show up on Thursday with some of our men who take care of the grounds, you know, plants. They don't just grow on their own. They need care. You want you want to you want to paint the steps over there. They always need painting. You want to show up on on Saturday, and uh, and do some work in the garden back there. Sure, there's plenty of opportunities for you to serve. You want to go to work on Monday morning, and serve your coworker. You want to go to school, serve your classmate. People need love and people need serving. There's endless opportunities. If you can't think of one, come see me. I'll give you ten or twelve. Opportunities to serve. Are you serving? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Paul says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. What's an ambassador? A representative. A person who carries a message 
of the one who sent him. Not his own personal message, but rather this message. And so you and I, we are ambassadors for Christ. And what's the message? His appeal through us, 2 Corinthians 5.20, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are imploring people, such a strong verb, to implore someone. Like, this is the most important thing we could ever talk about. Neighbor, co-worker, friend, a stranger. I'm imploring you. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best I can to tell you this is the most important conversation you and I will ever have. Are you willing to be reconciled to God? Turn from worshiping yourself. Turn from making Christmas about materialism and what I can get on my list. And turn towards the God who created you, who offers redemption, salvation, rescuing through his son Jesus Christ. Be saved. Serve him. Love him. Live for him. Look forward to eternity. That's what God calls us to do. That's the example we see of the prophets. They were serving us. That's what we see of the Savior. He was serving us. That's what He calls us to do. Serve one another. Serve our community. Are we doing that? We see the Spirit in verse 12. In the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So, the things that you and I now have received, they they were announced to us through those who preach the good news. That's the apostles here in this New Testament context. So we we had the Old Testament prophets through the Spirit of Christ. We've got the New Testament apostles by the Holy Spirit delivering the truth of God's Word. The Spirit is essential. That's why I prayed after I read the text. God, I'm completely and utterly dependent upon your spirit. I could get up here and tell stories and say things, and you just sleep right through it. Oh, yeah, I know when you sleep, I'm looking at you, I see you sleeping, and I think, I'm sorry, I wish I was more interested or interesting. I wish I could speak the language that you understood that tickled your fancy, that itches your ears, that kept you hanging on every next word. But you know what? That's, that's not me. I'm just so bald human this side of heaven trying to get along in this world. But I'm not offended when you fall asleep. Why? Because I'm not dependent upon my ability to put on a performance in front of you, to be interesting, to be funny, to be creative. I'm dependent upon the Spirit of God to do what only God Himself can do in my heart, my mind, in your heart, your mind, to open up His truth for you to glorify Himself, to make you more like Jesus. We need the Spirit. What did Jesus say about the Spirit? You know, when you think about Jesus, you say, oh boy, if I could just walk with Jesus, then I could do right. (laughs) Then I could be right. Then I could say the right things. He'd always be right there. I could ask him, hey, what do I say about this? Uh, My neighbor just asked me this question. What's the answer? You know, how great would that be? Jesus right there always with you. You You're tempted to think that'd be the end all be all. But John chapter 16 verse 7, this is what Jesus says. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage, Christian. Hey, For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, Jesus said, I will send him to you. Jesus said, it's to your advantage that he went to heaven and you have the Holy Spirit of God who has sealed you to the day of redemption. He has filled you with the knowledge of his truth. He is leading you, guiding you, directing you. We need people to be dependent upon the Spirit of God. Not fully understood. Perhaps not completely taught upon. But necessary. Galatians Chapter 5. A few words about the Spirit and what we should be doing with regard to Him. 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing what you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Christian, if you are alive, if you know the truth of the gospel, then you live by the Spirit. You are alive because of the Spirit of God. So, the instruction is, keep in step with the Spirit. Don't go back to do the old things that you used to do before you were saved. God's called you to a new way to walk by the Spirit. That's not to say you won't be tempted. You won't want to go back and taste some of those chocolate cakes you used to eat. Of course, but don't. Why? Because God is calling you to something better. Something more lasting. Something eternal. But we are dependent upon the Spirit of God to do that. If you walk in the flesh, you will fail. Dear Jesus, empower me by your Spirit when I get up here to proclaim the truth of your Word. I am incapable as a mere human, of doing right, of doing the thing that brings you glory. I need your spirit to empower me. The leaders of this church need the spirit of God to give us vision on where do you want us to go, what do you want us to do, how do you want us to spend the first dollar, the last dollar, what would you have from us? Lead us, point us in the right direction, empower us, bless us. Again, realizing that it's the spirit of God. There's an old hymn that says, Unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down, all is in vain. You can hand out as many loaves of bread as you want to. You can serve and help and do. You can even read the Scriptures. There's plenty of non-believers who have more Scriptures memorized than me. We need to pray that the Spirit of God would do what only He can do. And then he gets the glory. Oh, what a neat little church. They did this, they did that, they did the other. No, what a big, awesome God. Only he could do such a thing. That's what we want. We're going to be praying in 2020 that the Spirit of God fills each of us personally, corporately as a church, to do what only he can do to bring glory and honor to himself. And if he would be honored to use little old us, boy, wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be wonderful, little old us, we got a top secret clearance. We got this eternally weighty information. He says, yeah, I want you. Just broken, rickety, can't even grow full head of hair. Yep, you're going to be my representative. You go out there and, and tell people about this Christmas gift. You share with them. So we need to be living by the Spirit if we're going to be successful in that endeavor and bringing Him glory and doing what we should do. Lastly, we see in verse 12 that... These things are things into which angels long to look. You know, angels are right there with God, right? They've been around, looking, serving, studying, experiencing. And yet, they apparently don't have the top secret clearance that you've been. That's kind of fun, isn't it? I mean, God is so good. I'm so happy this Christmas. I've been given Jesus. This, this is the best thing ever. I'm so excited. God has treated me so well. 
And it's so fun to reveal, to explain, to, ex- to share this exciting information. I mean, it's so exciting that angels are even longing to look into, to study, to figure out more. What is this grace that God is revealing to his creation? It's so exciting seeing what God is doing. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. For by grace, that's chapter 2, chapter 3, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, that was Paul's attitude. He's pretty great though, wasn't he? He's actually pretty great. But he still had an accurate view of himself, right? I don't care how great you are, you're nothing outside of Christ. If you're something, let him who boasts, boast in this, that he knows the Lord Jesus. Right? If you wake up in the morning and you you think there may be a little something to you, better just quickly deflect that on to God to give him the glory and the credit and to remember that you and I, we're just the least of all the saints. But yet, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, you want something good? You want something exciting for Christmas? You want something that won't rust or rot or be destroyed in the next hurricane? Well, I've got the gift for you. The gift of salvation, of peace with God. And, and you've been given this grace, Christian. Just like Paul was given this grace. The grace to, to share this top secret information that's been hidden throughout the ages. And to bring to light, verse 9. Now, it's been hidden, but to bring to light everyone. Your neighbor, I don't care how mean that neighbor is. And you think, yeah, they're beyond hope. They're not. There is no such thing as someone who is beyond the hope of the gospel. I don't care what they're involved in, where they're at, what they're doing, what they're saying. They're not beyond the saving power of the one who saved you. They're just not. And to bring to light for everyone, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the first Baptist church of Isla Mirada, the manifold wisdom of God may now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That includes the angels. They're listening to you as you share this glorious good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with your neighbor and co-worker. And they're saying, huh, that's very cool. Verse 11, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. You say, I'm too nervous to share this great Christmas truth. Don't be. God says he'll give you the boldness. Paul prays for it. He, he Remember, he, he asked the people in Ephesians, hey, pray for me that I'll open my mouth like I ought to, that I'll speak boldly the truth. Yeah, the world tries to, to pressure you. The darkness wants to hide the light. Yeah, I get that. It, it can be a little pressure to share the truth of Christmas. But what, what are you going to fear, man? What, what's he going to do to you? Kill you? Remember what Paul said? Hey, for me, to die is gain. If I I die, I'm present with Christ. Like my salvation is now, like I'm in heaven, and my roof don't leak no more. So don't threaten me with a good time. I'm happy to go see Jesus. What? Man can't do anything to you. God's watching over you. It's all about God's business, right? You're God's ambassador. Like you think it's something to be the president's son or to be the prince. That ain't nothing. You're a child of the king, the creator of the universe. So you think you can walk up into somewhere with a little confidence? Yeah. Because you got credentials. Uh, Show me your badge. Yeah, I'm here with the king of kings, Lord of lords. Just want to share a couple things with you guys. Uh, you need Jesus, okay? It's good news. That's what you need. You need to stop living for yourself, worshiping yourself. You need to turn to God. You need to repent. You need to live for Jesus. It's good news. Trust me, you'll be happy. you have joy unspeakable. You'll even enjoy your flat tires. It's the craziest thing. 
craziest thing. But that's what I'm selling. Well, how much does it cost? It's free. It costs God, His only begotten Son. It costs Him everything. It costs you nothing. Follow and believe. This is good news. This is a good, good secret that's been revealed that we've been getting clearance, access into this information. And, and when we share it, people get saved. People get saved. They, they receive peace with God. These angels, they're excited about it. Luke chapter 15. Just so I tell you, there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This salvation stuff, I'm telling you, it's exciting. You made the right decision to follow Jesus, to be here this morning, to study the Word of God, to invest in eternity. So we just wrap up with the same two questions. Have you been granted top secret clearance? Do you know the truth? It's in God's Word. Study it, read it, make sure it's so. Grab me afterwards if you've got a question. And then if you do have this top secret clearance, information, secret to eternity, revealed in Christ Jesus, are you sharing this critical information with everybody? Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us in Jesus. Thank you for the good news of the gospel. Thank you for a reminder of what Christmas is all about. Thank you that the greatest gift is being at peace with you, looking forward to eternity. We've been here long enough to know that there's not too much here on this earth we need to be looking forward to. Might as well be looking forward to eternity. Thank you for the hope we have in Christ. Thank you that you're working all things together for our good, even the flat tires. Fill us with the joy of our salvation. Help us to understand these truths. Make a difference in our lives. Give us a holy smile. So the people look at us, they say, what? What's the reason for the hope that you have in us? Well, let me tell you the Christmas story. God, change our community, change Isla Mirada this week, next week, today, tomorrow, through us as we're your ambassadors, talking about Jesus, the reason for the season. Amen. Amen, amen. Stand on your feet. Let's, uh, let's sing about that joy.